can uh, skip again. Yep. So maybe we can get it started. So the uh, uh, Dr. Kraus can. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, welcome everybody who's here and uh, on the Zoom. We have many people, by the way. Oh. So maybe my task actually at the end to, uh, is to look at the questions. So it is a distinct uh, honor and pleasure for me to introduce uh, Professor Ronald Cross, uh, Professor of Medicine and Pediatrics and the Senior Scientist and Dolores Jordan and our Chair at Children's Hospital Auckland Research Institute. He's a Professor of Medicine. He uh, did his uh, Undergrad at uh, Harvard College, his uh, residency as uh, 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 his medical school at Harvard and residency at Hospital of uh, Boston Hospital, uh, the Harvard program, and then he joined the uh, NIH and was a, a kind of a senior staff at NIH uh, and senior investigator and started there actually his work on uh, lipoprotein metabolism. Actually, his claim of fame is actually to characterized lipoprotein metabolism in patients with diabetes, insulin resistant, uh, and uh, uh, the uh, metabolic syndrome. Um, he has published uh, in intensively in this area, more than 500 original article in this area. Uh, so his uh, work initially was mixed work of doing a clinical research, uh, doing uh, nutritional studies, uh, characterizing the genes identified uh, uh, and uh, kind of finding the treatment uh, based on uh, pre precision medicine. He also uh, the, uh, now has changed to actually studying these uh, you know, genetics of uh, meta metabolic disorder and lipoprotein metabolism in animal model in the lab and in also in vitro. Uh, that's his current research. Um, and multiple traits are led by him currently on a statin-treated population to examine the reproducibility and generalizability of the findings derived from both candidate genes and genome-wide research of, uh, and SNP characterization. Uh, and as I said, he's now not actually characterized them also in, in mice. Um, he has been a recipient of many, many awards uh, that I'm, I'm going to be, because of the sake of time, I'm not going to get into that and has had many administrative jobs at the NIH and also at UCSF. Uh, and he has been a great teacher and also has trained many, many uh, investigators that are also leader in this area. So uh, without further ado, I'm gonna invite him to come and give his talk. But he said, actually, he has my more tweaked around to make it more appropriate for the uh, clinicals, uh, uh, clinicians mostly. So he may not go too much into the, the, the basic part, but that's actually probably most appropriate. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Please. Well, thank you for that kind introduction, and I certainly appreciate the invitation to uh, address this group here and uh, virtually. Um, as you heard, I've uh, bridged uh, my own work from the clinic to the lab today. Um, since I know I'll be talking to cardiologists, I decided to focus this talk on clinical issues surrounding risk assessment with the general category um, lipoproteins and cardiovascular risk beyond LDL cholesterol. Now, I don't know uh, how this group feels about uh, current guidelines based uh, on LDL cholesterol for cardiovascular risk assessment and reduction, uh, but the main thrust of today's talk is to convince you uh, that this is not an adequate criterion. We need to dig deeper um, into lipoproteins. So um, let me see if I, uh, let's see, oh, here we go, yeah. First, uh, have I one disclosure because I'll be showing you methodology uh, to analyze lipoprotein particles that we developed and uh, have licensed to Quest Diagnostics. Uh, and because this is going to be a very clinical talk, I felt it would be instructive to begin with a case study, uh, actually a patient of mine in my lipid clinic that is very typical of many of the people that come to see me. This is a 64-year-old woman who has had high cholesterol, um, whose father and brother uh, have been on statins. A paternal grandfather had two MIs. Uh, she's very careful about her diet. She exercises, non-smoker, blood pressure normal, hemoglobin A1C has been okay. Um, and she is coming here because her physician talked about a statin, uh, but she was reluctant to take one. So here we have her clinical assessment. She's, again, uh, got a normal BMI and blood pressure. 
Her LDL cholesterol is 136, which is, you know, on the high side. HDL cholesterol, 49, sort of middle to low. Triglyceride, 100. I'll try to convince you that that's not a totally normal triglyceride. Um, and her 10-year estimated CB risk, risk using the current ACC AHA algorithm was 4.8%, which puts her right at the cusp of where guidelines uh, recommend considering um, uh, statin treatment, at least uh, evaluating that possibility. So the question uh, that I'll focus on for the rest of my talk, and we'll come back to this case at the end, is does she have clinically significant dyslipidemia? Is this really a problem? Now, there's many ways that could be assessed. I'll say at the beginning, one thing we often do is a coronary calcium score in that situation to see if there's any evidence for uh, atherosclerosis. But I'm going to argue that there's also a strong case to be made for further lipid and lipoprotein analysis. And this really uh, comes uh, to uh, the very prevalent dyslipidemia um, that is part of the metabolic syndrome that, um, again, I'll try to convince you is something relevant to this case. Uh, so what is this atherogenic dyslipidemia? I think probably all of you are aware of this. It's associated with insulin resistance, uh, metabolic syndrome, and type 2 diabetes. <clears throat> and in itself, it's, it's the most prevalent lipid trait associated with atherosclerotic coronary uh, vascular disease. And it's characterized uh, principally by high triglyceride levels, which are due to uh, triglyceride rich lipoproteins. I'll talk more about that in a minute. And their catabolic remnants, VLDL remnants and IDL. Low levels of HDL cholesterol, which I won't be talking a whole lot about, but I'll just uh, mention here that this uh, syndrome uh, has a reduction in these in large HDL particles that are more cholesterol rich and more associated with cardiovascular protection. Uh, absolute levels of LDL cholesterol are commonly not uh, increased in this syndrome. And this is really one of the key things that we noted early on when we were studying this syndrome. Um, how come LDL uh, cholesterol is not involved in a syndrome that is uh, felt to be related uh, to atherosclerosis and metabolic syndrome? And the reason is that there um, is an increased number of uh, LDL particles uh, that can be indexed by measuring apoprotein B, which is a structural protein of LDL as well as uh, intermediate and very low density lipoproteins. It's a measure of particle number, which again, I won't be spending a lot of time uh, today talking about, but it has been argued, I think uh, really strongly that this is a more uh, meaningful measure of uh, cardiovascular risk and LDL cholesterol. But within those particles, um, this syndrome is associated with a um, particular predominance of small dense cholesterol depleted uh, LDL particles. And I'm going to spend a bit of time talking about the latter, not just because this is something that I've been deeply involved with for a few decades, uh, but also because there's been a, a, a lot of, I think, unnecessary controversy uh, over whether um, this specific association of small LDL with cardiovascular disease is clinically relevant. And I'll try to convince you, I hope, by the end of uh, this hour that it is. Now, again, I'm going to be semi-historical here. Um, uh, what I'll start with is our studies of LDL particle diameter. Uh, and this is using uh, the technique of gradient shell electrophoresis, which we implemented many years ago, uh, to index the peak particle diameter of LDL, uh, either smaller in the 240 to 50 range or higher in the 265 to 2. 75 range. And notice that the distribution in the population, this is true for every single study that we've done, every single population and with other methods as well, there's a bimodal distribution of these particle diameters. So it's not just a, a, a Gaussian, it's not a schmear. Um, it really distinguishes two categories of individuals based on either predominance of larger LDL or predominance of smaller LDL. Uh, and we designated that in a very original nomenclature. Um, we called the larger ones A and the smaller ones B, and we've kind of stuck with that um, definition of a phenotype. So this is a metabolic phenotype, and what it's a phenotype for is every other aspect, of, at least the lipid aspect of metabolic syndrome, because those with pattern B uh, have consistently higher triglyceride, lower HDL cholesterol, just like we've been talking about metabolic syndrome, whereas LDL cholesterol between A and B is identical. So LDL cholesterol does not distinguish these, but ApoB does. 
And so this is uh, really uh, a discrete marker, um, which we've been used to some extent in genetic studies because it is a discrete marker um, for this um, rather extended set of lipid changes associated with metabolic syndrome uh, that are not reflected by LDL cholesterol. So I'll just briefly give you a snapshot of what we feel are the origins for these two discrete lipoprotein phenotypes. Um, they originate in the liver with the production of VLDL. In the case of uh, uh, a liver that has a normal or low pool of triglyceride, where there's not much genesis, not much uh, lipid coming back to the liver, the VLDL that are secreted are relatively smaller. They are triglyceride enriched, but they have a relatively small amount originating uh, from their secretion with ApoB. Uh, and when they're lipolyzed, they form larger LDL particles that are rapidly uh, uh, cleared by the LDL receptor. They have high LDL receptor affinity. But here we show the alternative pathway uh, where a triglyceride pool in the liver is expanded uh, all too commonly um, in our population today. Those with obesity, those with non-alcoholic fatty liver disease um, are secreting larger VLDL particles that are more triglyceride enriched uh, but due to various factors, including apoprotein composition, uh, uh, they are relatively slowly metabolized to remnant particles, which themselves can have reduced clearance. And this is a slow pathway that, uh, by a series of remodeling steps involving lipases, lipoprotein lipase, hepatic lipase, and lipid exchanges by cholesterol ester transfer protein, exchanging triglyceride and cholesterol with, um, with smaller LDO particles, uh, one gets a um, triglyceride-enriched LDO that, um, uh, again, a very slow process that is metabolized even further by hepatic lipase. And this is a parallel pathway uh, for reducing HDL. This hepatic lipase is also a determinant of low HDL in this syndrome. Uh, and notably, these particles, <clears throat> when they get small and very small, have very limited affinity for LDL receptors. So this extends this slow uh, inexorable evolution from large VLDL to small LDL to the point where these particles are hanging around longer in plasma because of their reduced hepatic uh, receptor clearance. And so this is, um, again, uh, the model that we've developed for just explaining these two uh, distinct phenotypes, A and B, uh, larger versus smaller LDL. But this is really the whole ball of wax with phenotype B because this, this uh, collectively is what underlies on a lipoprotein basis, um, the lipid disorders <laughs> that has been associated with metabolic syndrome. So I hope that much was clear. Now I'm gonna move on uh, to sort of dissect uh, some selected aspects of this syndrome um, to try to uh, convince you that uh, we really do need to dig deeper in our clinical assessment based on some of the lessons we've learned from this very common um, atherogenic lipid disorder and when I was invited uh, to come uh, to talk at Yale, which is my first visit, and again, very grateful to have the opportunity to come here, it reminded me of my long friendship and association with an early uh, scientist uh, who was trained at Yale named Margaret Albrink. And I, I, I can, I'm quite confident that most of you, and perhaps none of you, know that name. Uh, but I'm going to uh, go way back historically and tell you that the first report um, of uh, a triglyceride association with coronary artery disease was published in 1959 by Margaret Albrink. We got her MD here, uh, how many years ago, uh, MPH, uh, it was on the Yale faculty and whom I got to know and work with uh, for uh, many years. So I feel obliged to bring up uh, this early observation where she showed that patients with coron a very small population of patients with coronary disease versus controls had a shift upwards in their triglyceride, whereas their cholesterol, so total cholesterol uh, distributions were unremarkable. So this is kind of ancient history, um, but it was updated, been, been updated many times in much larger studies, this one being a meta-analysis of over 250,000 individuals, over 29 studies, many cases. Um, showing that the uh, triglyceride association with CHD adjusted for age, sex, smoking, and other lipids yielded an odds ratio of 1.72, highly significant. So that's the story about plasma triglyceride. The question is, 
is triglyceride itself an atherogenic factor, or does it represent something on the lipoprotein side? And the answer is, it is related to lipoproteins, uh, in particular, the remnants of these triglyceride-rich particles. And this involves not just VLDL, but chylomicrons um, that secrete these uh, triglyceride-rich particles, uh, and they can undergo this cascade, <clears throat> as I showed you, down to small LDL. Some of them can stop at IDL. Um, but there are remnants that are, associated, that are produced all along the way, both chylomicrons and VLDL remnants uh, that can penetrate the uh, uh, artery wall if they're not cleared by the liver. They're cleared through an APOE-dependent um, binding to their receptors as a primary uh, means of removal from plasma, uh, but excess levels uh, go to the arteries. And this is a highly atherogenic uh, particle, and there's a number of reasons for that. One is uh, underappreciated, and that is um, that uh, remnants, this, these are VLDL remnants as well as chylo remnants, uh, they're large, they have lots of lipid, but that lipid is very enriched in cholesterol, com even compared with LDL. Uh, uh, these particles, uh, on a particle basis, transport much more cholesterol than LDL. So if one is properly concerned about cholesterol trafficking into the artery, these are vehicles uh, that engineer that trafficking very uh, effectively. And it's one of the reasons, and this is a rather old slide, but it's really... Um, exemplifies data that has accumulated over the years, uh, showing that various ways of measuring remnants, and this has been elusive uh, clinically, um, it's very di difficult to actually pinpoint remnants. This is a way of estimating remnants by subtracting LDL and HDL from total cholesterol. Uh, it's very similar to the uh, Peterwald formula that divides triglyceride by five, but if one uses that definition and looks at the um, observational data relating uh, plasma levels of these remnants um, to coronary risk, one finds uh, that this is uh, at least, if not uh, more strongly associated with coronary disease and as LDL. And uh, some genetic studies using a kind of Mendelian randomization uh, also support this atherogenicity compared with a very strong but uh, more modest uh, MR uh, estimate of the relation of LDL based on uh, genetic uh, risk scores. HDL is sort of a, a, a case study here. It's kind of a, a negative control because we uh, we know that observational studies relate HDL to coronary disease. Um, reduced levels, I just discussed, uh, these large HDL particles are associated with reduced risk, but the genetics as well as clinical trials have failed to establish that raising HDL is beneficial. And that's all I'm going to say about that topic, although I'd be happy to come back to that in the discussion. Uh, and so there's evidence accumulating even that very high HDLs can be detrimental, but low HDL are associated with risk. What about the remnants? Let's come back to that. Uh, I'm going to show you several studies um, which have, I think, argued successfully um, that this is a meaningful measurement. Um, this is one carried out um, in individuals stratified by LDL cholesterol uh, greater than or less than 130. And in each case, uh, the remnant cholesterol level. Um, predict risk uh, independent of uh, LDL cholesterol, ApoB, and ApoA1. So here, uh, this level of remnants appear higher risk, even uh, in, in patients with higher LDL um, and low remnants, that risk is not uh, uh, significant. Uh, and then with low LDL cholesterol, the remnants predict risk. So that's really one uh, piece of evidence. Another is more recent uh, from the uh, PREDIMED study. Um, in which remnant cholesterol, again, was measured and associated uh, with CVD risk. Um, and this was even independent of triglycerides. So uh, this sort of, even in the same model, exceeded triglyceride as a determinant of risk. So the remnants really are powerful. Uh, so we don't, as I indicated, that, that remnant measurement is really uh, an estimate. It's not an exact um, way of uh, finding remnants uh, in the plasma uh, as a distinct species. Um, but I'm going to show you some data um, for this and other points in today's talk that are based on this technique that I mentioned uh, for um, looking at lipoprotein particles that we put into play a number of years ago now um, that is now offered by Quest Diagnostics as a way of digging deeper into, L into lipoprotein particle measurements that are direct. And this is a way of sort of squirting out um, a series of particles in a kind of a mass spec device and we kind of get an omic measure. We, these are 
based on 1,200 individual measurements of particle concentrations ranging from HDL through LVL, small LVL, large LVL. And here we can actually see the remnants. So this is one of the nice things about this is these are uh, IDL remnant particles that we measure directly, and here are the VLVL. So that's just a quick snapshot of a method that we've applied in various ways. And I'll show you one of those applications um, on this slide. Um, because we've looked to see uh, when we measure LDL cholesterol, again, the standard paradigm for risk assessment and uh, clinical management of lipids, uh, what are we actually measuring when it comes to lipoproteins? And this actually came as a surprise to me, but we've seen this uh, in several studies. This is just one of them um, involving 700 and almost 50 individuals in which we looked at the correlations between uh, LDL cholesterol and um, various lipoprotein fractions that I just showed you, we can measure uh, quite accurately in terms of their particle concentrations using this procedure, uh, which we call ion mobility, that I just showed you. Um, and so these are the correlations across the spectrum from the LDL to IDL, LDL. So LDL particles are associated with LDL cholesterol, of course, you'd expect that, uh, primarily uh, the large and medium LDL. Here are the small particles we talked about in a normal uh, this is a healthy population. They're not particularly elevated. Um, but even in these individuals, look, the uh, small, medium and small VLDL and, and large IDL, intermediate density particles, which really comprise that remnant lipoprotein peak I showed earlier, are correlated with LDL cholesterol. And that is based on the old criterion uh, in part for that measurement. It's not just the LDL density range, um, which was carefully established at 1019 to 106 grams from ml, if you're interested. Um, but it included uh, the next most buoyant region, um, 106 to 109 grams per ml, which en encompasses IDL. So what people fail to appreciate is that what I just told you about remnants really applies to the standard LDL cholesterol measurement and may contribute, I think, substantially uh, to all of the observations regarding LDL cholesterol. Uh, with the exception of, uh, that we're not yet talking about small LDL uh, in this context. We're just talking about uh, the correlations across the board in a healthy population. Um, so again, if we look at um, another feature of LDL cholesterol, maybe you may have seen this slide, uh, for individuals uh, whose LDL cholesterol is about 100, let's say equal uh, between those who have predominantly larger versus smaller LDL, um, in order to reach this level of LDL cholesterol, one needs fewer uh, LDL particles if they're already large and cholesterol enriched. Whereas to get to this level, same level with smaller LDL that are relatively lipid depleted, somewhat counterintuitively, they're not cholesterol enriched, they're cholesterol depleted, um, but th there'd be a greater number of those particles to achieve the same LDL cholesterol. So LDL cholesterol in individuals with pattern B uh, is going to represent a larger number of particles um, and uh, correspondingly a higher level of plasma ApoB. B. So that's really putting LDL cholesterol in the context of the lipoprotein particles, which are really the underlying uh, biological uh, pathway that uh, really underpins uh, everything related to uh, plasma lipid metabolism. Um, and so now we'll talk a little bit about the evidence um, that uh, features of this uh, profile, um, the atherogenic lipid profile are associated with coronary disease. And this is one of the early studies we carried out, um, uh, actually in collaboration with some folks um, uh, at, uh, uh, at Harvard, in which we um, <clears throat> measured uh, particles across the spectrum from in healthy population from the LDL down through uh, small LDL. And this is the distribution of particles expressed in concentrations of nanomoles per liter, uh, showing it sort of peaks in the middle uh, with medium LDL. Um, and in healthy people, not much of the VLDL or IDL or small LDL. Um, but if we, even in this population, if we look at um, the, the prospective association of each of these regions with subsequent MI risk uh, with a 15 year follow up, and this is with over 1,500 cases. This is the magnitude of coronary risk associated with each of these regions. <clears throat> so even though uh, the concentrations in the LDL are low, uh, there's a relatively uh, robust increase in MI risk. Uh, and the same is true for small LDL, very small LDL, and also medium LDL. Um, 
Um, what I wanted to point out, however, uh, is two things. One is that um, Quest Diagnostics, and I'll say this again as part of my disclosure, picked up this methodology and used these data, as I'll show um, uh, toward the end of this talk, uh, to uh, identify optimal uh, particle concentration uh, measurements for coronary disease risk reduction uh, that comprise medium and small LDL. They don't yet include very small LDL based on these data. But the second point I want to make, oops, I guess I should go back. Uh, the second point I want to make is that um, the large uh, LDL here um, are not associated with risk. So there's a, a, a quite a discrepancy between the risk associated with large LDL, there's no, uh, and those of smaller uh, LDL particles. And this is also evident, and I'm probably going to beat you over the head with data here because I spent so much of my time trying to convince clinicians that this is a significant thing to consider <clears throat> in their uh, risk evaluation. Here's another study that we published, uh, again, in collaboration with uh, uh, folks at Harvard, Paul Ritker and Sammy Mora, uh, more than a few years ago, uh, in which we looked at uh, a, a, a placebo uh, subgroup of the Jupiter trial, 5,600 individuals who, as you may remember, had relatively you know, modest LDL cholesterol levels, had high CRP, uh, and we analyzed that for proteins again by eye and mobility. Uh, and here we have basically the same result, uh, large and medium VLDL, uh, a little bit less in the IDL, um, and uh, a big peak in the medium and small, and also in this very small LDL region. So this is the collection of APOP protein-related uh, lipid lipoprotein abnormalities, um, these larger VLDL that are upstream, and the small, uh, medium, small, and very small that are downstream, uh, but again, not the large uh, LDL. That's way down here. That was not significant. Uh, so again, I realize in putting these together, I, I'd probably <laughs> do a little bit of overkill, but there's so many studies that people aren't aware of that I felt at least would uh, help solidify uh, the thesis that I'm presenting here, um, uh, that the um, Small LDL accounts for most of the risk of LDL cholesterol, along with the remnants uh, associated with coronary disease. This is a measurement using a homogene homogeneous assay for LDL cholesterol. This is a different assay um, that's now in clinical use, which is focused specifically on the cholesterol content of small uh, dense LDL, uh, which we have validated in our own uh, work. And um, this shows a, a, a stepwise increase in coronary risk in uh, quartiles of small dense LDL cholesterol, whereas uh, it's absolutely uh, flat uh, for, for large point. This is the remaining LDL cholesterol. So all of the LDL cholesterol associated with risk uh, in this large uh, study from Eric, 11-year um, follow-up uh, was due to uh, a very small, uh, small dense LDL. And this is independent of total cholesterol. And if you're not yet convinced, I'll show you yet another study. Um, I've got a couple more coming, um, in which um, a group from Mesa, over this is 3,000 individuals who were non diabetic. Um, here again, quartiles of LDL cholesterol, of small dense LDL cholesterol, uh, one through four, progressive increase in risk. And this was in individuals stratified both by low, by, uh, low LDL cholesterol uh, and LDL cholesterol greater than 100. This gradient is almost identical. So this is, again, independent of LDL cholesterol, this association. A meta-analysis was published a couple of years ago, um, which actually did not include those studies I just showed you, but those that were included did yield um, a net uh, odds ratio of 1.36 for uh, each standard deviation of uh, LDL, a small dense LDL cholesterol adjusted variously for lipids and uh, demographic characteristics. Um, so this is on a larger scale. One thing I wanted to point out with regards to um, the uh, discrimination of uh, small dense LDL phenotypes is um, that uh, I mentioned uh, the argument that VLDL and triglyceride are sort of at the starting end of this syndrome, generating all the downstream uh, LDL changes. Uh, and the crossover between phenotype A and phenotype B is actually at 95 milligrams per deciliter. That's where um, the switch uh, from A to B uh, seems to occur. And that's lower than most people consider to be 
um, an optimal triglyceride. And I think this level of 95 ought to be given serious consideration as a discriminant, not 150 that we currently use. I will admit some responsibility for the 150 because I had to negotiate with Scott Grundy when we defined the metabolic syndrome a few years ago to pick a level that most people could live with. That uh, level is 150. I think that's too high. This suggests um, that things start to happen at much lower levels of triglyceride. Um, so coming back to small dense LDL cholesterol, uh, a very uh, a couple of uh, famous studies uh, support uh, this association with risk. This is a Copenhagen Heart Study in which small dense LDL cholesterol emerged at the top of the list, superior to all other lipid measures in predicting risk. Uh, and this is the Framingham Offspring Study, which also used that measurement uh, and showed that it was the most uh, atherogenic lipoprotein parameter uh, in the prospective uh, Framingham Offspring Study. Uh, here we have large buoyant LDL cholesterol down here, small dense up here. Um, triglyceride is out there, is up there. Uh, remnant lipoprotein cholesterol is there. Uh, direct LDL cholesterol is there. So it's not as if these are not um, significant, it's just that there's a, a much stronger. Uh, risk association uh, with these uh, small dense LDL cholesterol. And again, from the Framingham study, um, this is essentially a dose response relationship across all individuals independent of sex. Uh, in the case of uh, African American versus non African Americans, all of these show this progressive increase um, in the hazard ratio um, in tertiles of uh, small dense LDL cholesterol, highly significant. Um, so that's the story with CVD, and I just uh, became aware of a study of stroke. This is, just came out uh, really this past couple of weeks, so I thought I'd share that with you because I thought this was yet another argument uh, supporting what I've just been telling you. But in this case, the relationship of small events LDO uh, to stroke, this is in 38,000 individuals, followed up for three years, um, again from a Danish study, um, the, uh, low, the large buoyant LDL. Flat. I mean, there's a confidence interval range here, but this is really, again, indicative. That this is really not a major pathologic uh, predictor um, of stroke compared with small events LDL. And this may reflect the fact that LDL cholesterol itself is generally not uh, as strongly associated with stroke as it is for coronary disease. And this may be one of the reasons because these are cholesterol poor LDL that are associated with that risk. So having run through what I hope is a compelling and not terribly selected, there are people that have argued based on other studies that large and small LDL are equally atherogenic. I could take up that discussion, if you will, if anyone's interested. Um, but I think uh, having shown you that there uh, is a difference in most of the uh, large studies that have been carried out uh, in risk between larger and smaller LDL, one can point to atherogenic features with small dense LDL that have been identified. Uh, one, as I mentioned at the outset, this is uh, the product of a very slow, relatively slow pathway, and the particles themselves are cleared uh, relatively inefficiently uh, by hepatic LDL receptors. That's been shown because of the change in the surface structure that obscures um, a, um, uh, the active site of uh, uh, LDLR recognition, the ApoB B ligand region is obscured. Those particles are cleared less effectively. They're hanging around longer. Um, and that exposes them to the artery where they have greater affinity for arterial proteoglycans and larger LDL, favoring their retention, which is a big issue since LDL can escape in and out. But if they're caught, that's where bad things start to happen, as you all know, including oxidative modification. Uh, and these particles are more susceptible uh, to formation of lipid hydroperoxide. That's something we showed in a couple of studies uh, and others have shown many years ago. There's other reasons here I won't spend time on to implicate these particles, but um, all of these features render um, these small LDL that have properties that are not strictly dependent on their cholesterol content. They're delivering cholesterol to the artery. Of course, that's important, but that's not their major uh, mechanism of atherosclerosis risk. It's these other properties we feel uh, that are more important. Now, clinically, again, I'm going to come back to the clinic and the standard measurements. Um, can one begin to predict levels of small LDL using the standard lipid uh, concentrations? Um, and the answer is yes, statistically. These are all statistical associations with LDL cholesterol, triglyceride, and HDL, and ApoB. But you'll see in each case 
um, there's a huge amount of misidentification. Individuals with small LDL, um, with normal LDL cholesterol, as we've talked about in the other way around as well, uh, people with a high LDL, these are what we call discordant uh, concentrations where their small LDL as well as their ApoB is disproportionately low. And that's because they have these uh, small, they have these large LDL particles. Triglyceride is a better predictor as is non HDL cholesterol. But again, uh, it's imperfect. Uh, and so one can argue, well, you can use these. They do work as risk, as risk markers. Non HDL is a perfectly good one. So is ApoB. But you're not pinpointing specifically uh, a particle underlying that measurement uh, that may be pathologically important. So I'll come back uh, to the case study uh, that I uh, started with. Um, as I told you, I was going to try to convince you um, uh, that she had something uh, to be concerned about. And the reason is we went on and did um, what are called advanced lipoprotein tests uh, using uh, uh, in part the Quest uh, laboratory profile that I mentioned um, adopted our ion mobility procedure. Um, and so what's shown in red, um, some of you may have seen this kind of, this is taken directly from her report, by the way, she, uh, uh, you know, uh, protecting her identity, she allowed me to show this. Um, her LDL particle number, despite having an LDL cholesterol that was only about 130, uh, her particle concentration is way uh, into the uh, high range based on um, the criteria we established from that study I showed you earlier. Uh, as our uh, small and medium LDL off the chart in terms of uh, risk potential uh, based on uh, those in other data. Um, and she has a low level of large uh, HDL. Uh, this is in conjunction uh, with what we call the pattern B I showed you earlier, uh, small LDL size. So here her lipid levels, remember triglyceride was 100, um, did not really jump out uh, and say that this is somebody who's got really bad atherogenic dyslipidemia, but by digging under the surface and looking at the lipoprotein particles themselves, one is able to extract um, this pretty compelling set of data, um, which puts her at higher risk and relates uh, certainly, I'm sure, to her family history of uh, lipid disorders and cardiovascular disease. Um, and so in the last uh, few minutes before I open this up to questions, I want to take uh, you one step further into an area um, uh, a little bit uh, off the topic of metabolic syndrome, because we went as part of this evaluation one step farther and we measured her lipoprotein little a. I'll tell you more about that uh, in a moment. I think many, probably all of you are familiar with this, uh, but this level was, uh, was more than twice the upper limit of normal as well. So she had the full package of um, atherogenic dyslipidemia with phenotype B and an elevated uh, lipoprotein A. And so this puts her, uh, it put her in my view, and she agreed in a category uh, that really uh, merited further evaluation. So I'll just spend a, a few minutes reminding you of uh, the LPA story, because that's now emerging on the scene uh, really as a very important risk uh, marker, as well as a potential target for treatment. Finally, we've known about for several decades, but it's been for the most part, under the radar screen, most physicians, the people that I see in consultation rarely have an LPA measurement. Um, and that's in large part because um, methods for this uh, assay were slow in being uh, normalized. Um, and as I'll show here, um, this is a very strongly genetically determinant uh, particle. It's an LDL-like particle. It's really an LDL to which apoprotein A um, which is a homologue of plasminogen with multiple Kringle repeats. Uh, and this protein is covalently bound to APOE at a specific site and sort of wraps around the uh, LDL particle. Uh, and it actually obscures, again, uh, recept the receptor recognition site, which uh, causes it, like small LDL, to circulate uh, much longer than normal LDL. Uh, this is under strong genetic control. There's multiple, at least 40 or 50, maybe more, 50 or more isoforms that vary in size, in some cases, uh, sequence. Um, so it's highly heterogeneous, uh, a huge range of values. Very few people have zero, but they can go up all the way to several hundred. And I've seen them all along that spectrum, uh, varying uh, by these isoforms. Um, and those uh, gene variants, and the gene underlying up to the lakes is most of the genetic variance is associated with the locus uh, at which 
the LPA gene is found um, and um, those variants are highly uh, related to a risk. They, are, they influence uh, uh, expression through EQTLs and there's uh, sequence variants as well. Um, and variants at this locus that raise LPA are associated not just with cardiovascular disease, but also very importantly with aortic stenosis. Again, probably the cardiologists in the room uh, already know this, um, and also um, are familiar with our attempts to lower LPA uh, by statins. Uh, they don't work. They sometimes actually raise LPA. And uh, again, like the small LDL story, this is kind of a, a hidden uh, devil um, uh, in, in plasma for uh, more than a third of the population have levels of uh, LP little A greater than 75 nanomoles per liter, which has been sort of established as a clinically significant uh, cut point, uh, because that's where it starts to see um, a substantial increase in hazard ratio. Uh, this is uh, present in, in, in more than a third of the population. So it's very common to have this, uh, particularly in families where there's uh, a, a, a history of family members with vascular disease. So uh, just touch on some clinical uh, perspectives that I'll bring based in part, large part on guidelines that have been published uh, sort of with my own twist. Um, in the case of uh, what do you do if you have high LPA um, and you know this is strongly genetic and uh, patients worried about it, like the patient I just described, um, there's a strong argument made for uh, maximally lowering LDL levels, however you want to measure it, even LDL cholesterol, uh, to uh, the, the maximum uh, tolerable lower level that you can achieve, uh, because that attenuates um, the uh, absolute risk of vascular disease. If you go from an absolute risk of 10% to 1%, the relative risk due to LPA of threefold only takes you up to 3%. So just mathematically, you have reduced the absolute risk by lowering uh, LDL, even if you can't lower the LPA. Um, and the other way, reason to measure it is to screen patients who have a strong family history of particularly early coronary ca cardiovascular disease uh, and or, or aortic stenosis, um, as well as uh, first degree relatives of those patients, because this is so highly monogenic uh, that 50% of those first degree relatives statistically will be affected. And in those individuals, and I see many of them, uh, one would at least put them on alert uh, to be more attentive to factors that could lower their uh, LDL and other risk factors to counteract uh, that genetic burden. Question is, uh, and this is sort of out there, um, can you really improve cardiovascular risk by lowering LPA? Uh, that has also been raised in the case of small LDL, and we have some evidence for that. But in the case of LPA, we haven't had good evidence because we haven't had good treatments. However, as again, I think you probably all know, um, the um, current um, PCSK9 inhibitors, uh, uh, here is shown alirocumab, um, are capable of lowering LPA levels on average about 25 to 30%. The paper was published several years ago showing uh, that in the, in the conjunction of a clinical trial uh, of this drug, uh, there was a progressively uh, greater increase uh, in, in risk reduction uh, in proportion uh, to the reduction LPA. And this is even, um, uh, so these are levels that are, are uh, start off in many cases normal. So, e but, so even in this range, there is a post hoc analysis showing uh, a linear improvement in risk as one increases um, LPA levels 15% relative risk reduction per 25 nanomole reduction in LPA independent of LDL cholesterol. So this is pointing in the direction uh, of benefit, but uh, are we gonna use this expensive drug uh, in all our patients? The answer is insurance companies often don't let us do that, certainly not for high LPA alone. Um, and so we're all uh, waiting expectantly uh, for at least two genetic-based treatments, um, one using uh, an ASO and the other uh, an antisense, uh, other a, um, uh, SARNA uh, that have been shown to lower LPA levels by as much as 80 to 90 percent. And so that finally, will, when, it, when those are approved, hopefully that'll happen in our lifetimes uh, to the uh, FDA, at least for uh, the first phase of uh, uh, clinical use, that probably will be limited to patients in whom the cat's already out of the bag, patients that already have coronary disease, uh, when we'd like to be able to use this more preventively. 
but at least it's something that holds promise for the future. So I'll close again uh, on a clinical note, um, considering what we've just talked about in our case and the other uh, clinical uh, situations that we've described in um, uh, the area of metabolic syndrome and high LPA. This is all embraced by what has been called, not a term I've invented, uh, ad advanced lipid testing, which I think is kind of a, a fuzzy term. That's what's out there. Uh, so when should we consider lipoprotein assessment of risk beyond LDL cholesterol? And this, again, comes back to the patient I showed you. Uh, so I would argue, and this is my perspective, because it's not in the guidelines, uh, this has not yet been given uh, sufficient um, credit uh, by my colleagues with whom I once worked in, um, uh, in the uh, adult treatment panel guidelines for, the, uh, for lipid management. Um, it's not reached that level because we, we still lack some of the hard nail clinical evidence uh, that managing um, some of these things uh, can be beneficial. Um, but everything points in that direction, just as we showed for LPLA. So where does this have value? Well, again, if there's borderline cardiovascular risk using current algorithm, and that's the case I showed you, things are kind of borderline, you're not sure, there's a family history, um, you, you dig deeper. Um, um, certainly, if there's uh, lipid evidence for athlogen dyslipidemia using standard measurements, triglycerides, uh, much over 100, 95 maybe, um, lower HDL, normal LDL, these are patients, maybe many of them have metabolic syndrome, many of them have insulin resistance, a lot of them are uh, centrally obese, uh, it helps to uh, find out how severe their dyslipidemia is by looking at it in terms of lipoprotein uh, profiles. And uh, again, many people have coronary artery calcium scores before they uh, have these lipid measurements. Uh, but there are patients that I see who would, you know, wish to have a coronary calcium score and who might, or whom I think it may be relevant, haven't yet ordered one of the patient I showed you because so I was going to treat her anyway. Um, but patients who kind of come up with a, a little bit of something going on, but their lipids don't show it, that may be where you find uh, the, uh, 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 the ammunition um, in the particle measurements. And then those with a significant family history of premature cardiovascular disease would also be candidates because of the genetic uh, influences uh, on both atherogenic dyslipidemia and uh, high LPA that we discussed. Um, and I would also argue, this is something I do in my own clinical practice, uh, which has not yet uh, reached uh, the mainstream, um, is uh, to use particle testing in assessing the adequacy of lipid lowering treatment. Uh, particularly in high-risk patients when we've not achieved maximal LDL lowering. Uh, so, we, so we kind of monitor the small LDL. And if we have gone so far with statins and maybe zetamide, maybe um, you know, really intensive a dietary approach and the small LDL, uh, for example, remains high, um, we would, I would tend to be more aggressive and perhaps up the dose of statin, um, be more intensive with diet uh, to use that as the marker rather than strictly relying on the uh, rather fuzzy uh, criterion of LDL cholesterol. So um, I've taken you through, uh, I think, these clinical uh, arguments for being uh, more inquisitive um, about lipoprotein abnormalities in your patients uh, who may be at risk for cardiovascular disease. Uh, and so I'd be happy uh, to stop here and take any questions. And thanks for your attention. If you stand here and I, I have to repeat the question because I think they do not provide us with the microphone size. Oh. Uh, can hear it. Okay. All right. So, Jeff and then. Uh, thank you very much for that. This is a very good talk. Very educational. You mentioned in your group uh, we're all very, very aware of that file. Again, Yeah, 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 okay.
Okay. Well, thank you. That's a great question. And I'll try to keep my answer short because the answer, uh, no, <laughs> but the answer uh, basically is yes and yes, because both things, uh, both issues that you mentioned, I think apply. Uh, uh, first of all, as I did mention, um, uh, there's not necessarily a systemic marker like CRP that goes along with high small LDL, but there's definitely an in, a tissue inflammatory effect that takes place. Um, and this has been demonstrated in cellular studies, um, less so in, in vivo, certainly not in humans, but there is evidence that through oxidative modification, which these particles are more susceptible to, and that's due uh, to a, a, a thinner uh, cholesterol depleted um, encapsulating membrane. So they're more uh, susceptible to entry of uh, pro-oxidants uh, and, and uh, oxidized radicals that um, become inflammatory. So, so that's an inflammatory effect uh, that wouldn't necessarily result in the CRP levels in Jupiter, but it's part of the mechanism of these particles. Now there's another, the answer, the, the yes answer to the second option you presented is based on work that has not yet been published, but we're deeply involved with. There is a zone on the particle profile I showed you um, between LDL and HDL, which we call the mid zone. It's kind of uh, a terra incognita because nobody has really looked at particles that, uh, uh, that overlap uh, between LDL and HDL in size, right between their distributions. And what we find in that region, in that mid zone region, um, uh, and we saw this in Jupiter as well, um, there was a highly significant relationship with risk that is correlated with CRP levels. It's also correlated with insulin resistance. So there's, uh, and we're, I'll just say this, it's not exactly confidence. We've been working on this for a number of years now and we're sort of trying to drill in, um, but we have evidence um, that these are uh, particles in which there are inflammatory particle, particles, inflammatory proteins uh, that are adherent to lipoprotein particles, uh, uh, HDL and probably some, uh, uh, some of the small LDL as well. So, so they form these complexes um, that we feel are pro-inflammatory uh, that may explain something I briefly alluded to earlier that very high levels of HDL, you're probably aware of this, have been associated with coronary risk. It's sort of a U-shaped uh, distribution. Coronary risk is higher at the low end and also the high end. So these particles tend to appear uh, with very high levels. So we think, and this is one thing we're, we're working on, that the inflammatory connection, this would be true for Jupiter, um, is um, it, it involves a, a, a set of uh, particles that do appear to be related to lipoproteins uh, in this mid-zone region. Unfortunately, that's all I can say because we're still working on it. Sorry, that it was a longer essay. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you for a really interesting presentation. Um, I have a question about the that's the way it started for me i must say that's seeing patterns yeah Okay, all right. I'll try to keep this short as well, but I'm not sure I can promise. This is a good question. Let me start with the second one. Um, so once you've sort of maxed out with statins uh, and maybe azetamide, 
and the LDL cholesterol hasn't reached that magic number of 70 or less, which is not necessarily adequate for all people, but it's not not bad place to aim for. But if you don't get there, um, what else can you do, particularly considering uh, the underlying possibility, which could be assessed of having the small LDL phenotype underneath that LDL cholesterol. Um, and so um, uh, there, there's two general things to consider, at least in my practice. It's not in the, <laughs> nowhere in the textbook. Uh, but one is uh, uh, we, we know well, we can uh, improve this by um, diet and uh, weight loss can be very effective, of course, very challenging. Low, lower carbohydrate intake, as you probably are all aware, um, by driving uh, less uh, lipogenesis and also helping uh, to promote and deliver greater uh, fat oxidation um, can reduce the input function uh, coming out of the liver. So there's less of these small particles being generated downstream by lowering those large triglyceride-rich VLDL uh, dietarily. And there's one little piece of information I'll share with you, and that is uh, it has to do with nicotinic acid or niacin, which uh, was really the first pharmacological uh, approach to lipid lowering that was ever used worked pretty well at high doses. Trans, uh, was uh, overtaken, of course, by everything we're using now. And it's fallen by the wayside because of trials in which LDL cholesterol levels have been maximally lowered uh, by statins down well below 70, averaging like 50 or so. Uh, with, uh, to test whether raising HDL, which niacin does, is beneficial. Those studies failed, um, showing, I think, rather definitively, along with the genetics, that trying to raise HDL, even though we think it'd be helpful, is not therapeutically effective. However, we published two papers showing uh, that if you lower the uh, uh, small LDL particles, at the interface between very small LDL with niacin, that's associated with reduced risk. Um, we have unpublished data showing it's related to um, improved mortality. And so these are in patients whose LDL cholesterol hasn't gone as low as 70. Um, so there is a lipid lowering effect of niacin that appears to benefit these small particles. And I invoke that in some of my patients uh, who fall into that category. Um, now, uh, uh, the first question you asked, I think I kind of answered part of already, and that is where do we intervene? Um, is that what you were asking in the first question? Of, of, of how do you target? Um, uh, well, you know, diet is the number one approach, uh, and we've studied, and I won't recommend um, these extremely low-carb diets. Uh, generally, I've been involved in lots of controversies about these, these so-called uh, keto ketogenic diets, but we did study this in type 2 diabetes, a population of type 2 diabetics, um, and showed that um, that very low-carbohydrate diet knocked the stuffing out of the pattern B profile, lowered the very the small LDL quite substantially. Um, and so that, that's true along the whole spectrum of carbohydrate intake. We've shown that separately. As you drop carbs, uh, you improve uh, that profile quite substantially. Better if you can achieve weight loss at the same time. And then after that, we don't have, we don't have a lot yet. I mean, there's been interest in fibrates, but they have kind of failed um, out there. I rarely use fibrates anymore. Um, but I would keep nice, and even though it's a potentially diabetogenic, you have to watch that. It's not an absolutely easy drug to use, but it uh, sometimes pulls out of the bag when, when necessary. You know, might I ask two questions here? Uh, yeah. uh, but first of all, excellent talk and really insightful, really insightful, uh, because it's all your work. So, uh, okay. so um, <laughs> the uh, so question I have is that you mentioned the lipoconeal aging, and there are 75 of your cutoff, which is like you probably laugh with that varies. Or something. Like yeah. Before. Yeah, but for overall, they have a lot of patients have 75, 80, but then they have patients of 600, 700. So now, obviously, the, the anti stents all that going to come, and gene therapy that I mentioned it, is going to be expensive, and you have to focus on people. So, at what level do you think is an independent risk factor for New York? What levels of the African level A? That's one question. Then you actually mentioned, obviously, the triglyceride and the diet and the uh, Weight loss, etc. GFP one uh, receptor agonist stuff can also, you know, some. Like P parts, you talking about people? Uh, yeah, GFP one receptor. Oh, GFP. Oh, GFP. Oh, yeah. My question is that does, does it have any effect on the lipoprotein profile in a small test? Yeah. Uh, well, that. Uh, that did, we've been interested in GLP-1. We've actually come up with a gene that regulates GLP-1 receptors, interestingly. Um, but um, 
I'm not aware of any compelling evidence on, this, on the small LDL or, or LPA for that matter with GLP-1. I think that does deserve further study. It may be, it may be in literature somewhere and I just missed it, but I'm not, I'm not aware of that. Uh, and as far as the LPA question, um, the risk relationships I showed were independent of, of LDL cholesterol. So it is, uh, and that's been shown repeatedly as well as in Mendelian randomization studies that this is a so-called independent risk factor. It's on its own genetic axis. So, I mean, uh, the yeah, the senior gene disorder. Yeah. Um, I, I probably can't answer that in terms of is there is there a cutoff because the risk relationship is is continuous, and one gets to increasing likelihoods. It's all I can say of um, a big monogenic effect. If that's what you're asking, uh, as you get to higher levels, I would say that's still greater than seventy five, because um, again, this is partly largely uh, based on my clinical experience, um, uh, when, their family, uh, when families are studied who have levels that are 100, let's say, not super high, that that, that, that is, um, is often reflected by increased LPA levels to similar degrees in other family members. So I tend to think of it as, 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 uh, as a single gene effect, uh, even at relatively low levels of LP. Let me see if there's anything in the audience. There's mm -hmm. a chat question. I appreciate the in-depth coverage of the topic. If uh, LPA levels of more than 180 are associated with uh, atherosclerosis risk close to that of the patient with heterozygous yeah. age, is it responsible to attempt to treat these yeah. patients earlier yeah. with PCSK9? Yeah, so the question is, is there a role for PCSK9 and patients who have uh, high LPA um, in, in conjunction with, with high LDL? Uh, and the answer is yes, there's a case that can be made, but unfortunately the insurance companies are deaf to that request. I've tried many times to argue that um, this combination, even if the LVL level doesn't approach heterozygous FH, a um, high level accompanied by high LPA ought to be like you know, a smoking gun, a uh, you know, bomb ready to go off um, in patients without pre-existing coronary disease. Um, but I haven't been able to get insurance companies to pay attention to that other than by getting on the phone and making a lot of noise. Sometimes I succeed, uh, but we're not yet there in terms of clinical guidelines. Thank you very much. That okay. was a okay. Thank you. Uh, I, the schedule of Dr. Cross has changed because he has to leave earlier. So those of you are actually going to meet the other. Uh,